If you want to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6, please be doing so at this time. Daniel chapter 6. <clears throat> I saw a news report earlier this week that sounded promising. Apparently, through studies, they've shown that when you wear a necktie, on average, it cuts off a small percentage of blood flow. Well, men, we've known that for a long time. Um, so I thought, well, maybe there's hope. We might be able to get rid of the tie after all. And then the doctor, who was kind of there for another reason altogether, was just sitting there laughing, shaking her head. So... Ties remain for a long time. And I told Ron, it's not the tie. It's the collars on the neck that begin to shrink the longer you own the shirt. They shrink. They really do. They begin to shrink after a while. And so someone put me on to a, a special type of shirt that has a, a button that's stretchy now. You know, so, so the button has elastic in there, so you don't have to get those weird clips to extend it. it just stretch it over a good two inches and button it, and you're good to go. And we wouldn't have to worry about tying them right and all the... See, we make life hard on us, don't we? Anyway. So what does that have to do with the sermon tonight? Well, it's about difficult situations, challenging times. We're going to be looking at Daniel. He knew exactly what it was like to wear a necktie. You know, this, this sermon this week has troubled me some, and I'll, I'll explain why. We're going we're to talk real simply and look at a couple of lessons learned from Daniel chapter 6. But maybe for another time, we'll talk about this subject. How many times when we look at the Bible, think about all the Bible characters that the Lord has delivered? And we use that as examples. Daniel's one we'll talk about here in a minute. And as a matter of fact, one of the songs in our songbook, song number 279, let me grab one real quick. Song number 279 is entitled, He is Able to Deliver Thee. And so we always talk about the Lord is able to deliver us. And we sing songs about the Lord is able to deliver thee. And of course, the song at the end of the chorus, it does clarify, though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest, our God is able to deliver thee. And even the song that Travis led earlier, song number 69, the title of the song is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. But really, if you look at the words of the song, it's about prayer. It's about prayer to our Lord. Um, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And so we believe in this. We, 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 we live our lives by this. Verse 2 introduces the idea of trials and temptations. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And so when we sing this song, this song isn't really about deliverance. It's about prayer, taking our problems to the Lord. And so a sermon idea that I'm working on that I think kind of would help us face the reality and truly what is most important will probably be called when the Lord does not deliver us. When the Lord does not deliver us. Because think about biblical history. Yeah, we have a lot of examples, and we'll look at a good example tonight of where the Lord delivered Daniel from the lion's den. But what about all the other times people suffered and died? And what happens is people use these instances where they perceive the Lord has not delivered them as reasons not to believe but when you boil everything away and you come down to what we mentioned this morning to be truly most important, you find the Lord will always deliver. But we have to understand what he delivers us from. And so we might look at that later when the Lord does not deliver. But tonight we're going to talk about Daniel and 
the lion's den. So if you would, in your Bibles, Daniel chapter 6. The way this begins, Daniel is considerably older now than he was at the beginning of this. Um, Daniel was carried away into Babylonian captivity um, under Nebuchadnezzar. And he and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were young men at the time. Well, now enough time has transpired that uh, Babylon has fallen. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, was the king, and that was the night of the, the writing on the wall. The Medo-Persian force came in and took them. And so now we're under the reign of the Medes, the, the Persian army there, the kingdom, and it is King Darius. And so Daniel has, has aged. We don't know exactly. We could probably make a guess. But he's definitely not the young man that he once was. And Darius, Daniel has, has, has kind of endeared himself to the king. The king has come to appreciate Daniel. But others standing around did not have the same appreciation for Daniel. And so we begin the chapter in Daniel chapter 6 there. We talk about King Darius and he, he put, um, he set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom and of those three governors of whom Daniel was one. That the satraps might have account, give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. So verse 3, Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was with him. And the, king gave, uh, and, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. All right, so Daniel has done very well. And the Lord has been with Daniel. An excellent spirit, as it says there. But then others standing around began to get jealous. They were concerned. The governors and the satraps there in verse 4, they they. they decided to try to find something that they could bring a charge against Daniel. Something that would lower Daniel in the eyes of King Darius. And as we read through here, Darius thought very highly of Daniel. Very, very highly. And we'll il illustrate that as we go through there. But these governors, these say traps, they're not happy with this. They want to be able to bring some charge against Daniel, but they couldn't. Look at what verse 4 says, the latter part. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said in verse 5, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. All right, so we've got to use Daniel's religion against him. We've got to use Daniel's God against him. This is the only way. And the problem is, currently there was no law in place within the, the Medo-Persian Empire that would find Daniel guilty of anything. There was nothing yet that would charge him with some sort of breaking of the law when he worshipped his God. So they had to make something. So we pick up there in verse 6. So these governors and satraps, they, they, they came before the king, they, they thronged the king kind of think about just a whole group of them just coming around the king and and they said king darius live forever this was a common way of showing honor to the king king darius live forever now i'll go ahead and jump towards the end of the story real quick when darius comes and, and daniel's been overnight in, in in the lion's den and darius says daniel daniel has your god delivered you his first words were long live the king King Darius lived forever. It was a praise to the king, showing honor there to the king. But anyway, they approached the king with this, this praise. And all the governors of the kingdom in verse 7, the administrators and the satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal decree, a royal statute, and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So here's what they come before the king. Say, king, we've got a good idea. You're a great king. And you deserve the recognition. So let's make a decree that for 30 days, no one can make any petition of any gods other than you. Now, sometimes, depending on your personality, your first thought may be, 
what's up? What do you want with this? But Darius kind of liked the idea. They said there in verse 8, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Then King Darius signed the written decree. So here's what they're playing on. Apparently, it was a law in the Medes and the Persians that if the king issued a decree, it could not be changed. Apparently, not even by the king. Okay? So this was their idea. And if you violated this, if you prayed to some god during the 30-day period of time, you'd be thrown into a lion's den or the den of lions. And so Darius, he signed it. Why not? He didn't stop and think about the ramifications. He didn't stop and think about how it would affect others. He liked the decree, so he signed it. So then we pick up there in verse 10. Daniel was, was aware of this. Matter of fact, Daniel very well may have been present when all these governors and satraps were there getting the king to sign it. He was aware of this decree. So what did he do? Verse 10, he went home. And in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God as was his custom these early days. Now, what Daniel was doing is something that Solomon, I believe it was Solomon, kind of issued, not really a decree, but, but what he was telling them that the people of the Lord would always, whenever they would pray, they would pray towards where God was, or at least where the presence of the Lord was. <clears throat> so they would pray towards Jerusalem. They would pray towards their land, the land of Canaan. They would pray towards the temple. So it wasn't that it was some um, requirement per se by God, but it was showing that they're petitioning the Lord. They prayed in the direction where, from their understanding, God was. Think about it. Anytime they went before the presence of the Lord, where did they have to go? To the temple, to Mount Zion, there in Jerusalem. And so this is where, from their understanding, the presence of the Lord was. So they would pray to God, make petitions, in that direction, even from Babylon. So he would go to the, what does it say? He says he went to the window there. Uh, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. So Daniel was a creature of habit or practice probably is a better way of putting it. Three times every day he prayed to God since he first got to Babylon, since the early days there. And everybody knew this. This was what Daniel would do. So then these men assembled in verse 11 and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Uh, king, have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Verse 13. So the answer and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. So they say, the king, you know this law that, that you, you just signed just a little bit ago, that decree? He says, yes. We found someone guilty of it. So you would imagine at this moment, if he was like some of the kings we've known in the past, he would have said, all right, off with his head. Or in this case, lion child. Throw, throw him to the den of lions. But what they did was, is they said, Daniel, that Daniel, he doesn't show you honor. He goes to his God and he prays three times a day. How or what was the reaction of King Darius? Look at verse 14. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. Let me tell you how displeased he was. Take this to heart. This shows how his, his uh, admiration and his respect for Daniel. He was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. 
and he labored until the going down of the sun to deliver him. He didn't think about how it would affect Daniel and the others who were there worshiping Jehovah God. So now he's realized that the very man that he has held high respect for and the man whose God Darius respected, at least respected more than he probably did his, his own gods that he worshiped, he now loses sleep. How do I solve the problem? I wrote my name on that. I, you know, I signed this decree. How do I fix this? According to the law of the Medes and Persians, it can't be undone, and I cannot undo it. So all day he frets. All night he frets. What does this say about Darius and his appreciation for Daniel? And what does it say about Daniel and how that he has won over the respect of the king in Daniel's obedience unto God and his faithfulness? So Darius, we continue here. Verse 15, then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Now, Put yourself in the Darius position. Kind of like Pilate's a little bit, a little bit. Pilate didn't see anything, any reason why Jesus should die. But Pilate washed his hands of the matter and let the Jews carry out what they set about to do. Darius saw no way out of the situation. So since Darius couldn't deliver Daniel, I mean, think about that. Darius could not deliver Daniel. He told Daniel basically, May your God deliver you. Think about that. He had trust in Daniel's God. Now, how much trust, we don't know because we're going to see what's about to happen. But at least he had a measure of trust to say to Daniel, there in verse, seven, uh, there in verse 16 there, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought, verse 17, laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of the lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. In other words, once the stone was rolled into place, they used a type of wax and they used various signet rings, one including the kings, they left their impressions to show that if the door was opened before the king gave the decree. And so Daniel goes to the night. He sits there within a den of lions all through the night. Look at verse 18. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. And no musicians were brought before him. See, back then they didn't have radios, televisions. They had live musicians. And if you were a king, you'd have live musicians that would come play for you. And maybe sing you a lullaby, sing you to sleep. David calmed the... The, 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 the soul of Saul on many occasions there, but not tonight. No musicians brought before him. His sleep went from him. Then the king rose very early in the morning, in verse 19, and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice, saying to Daniel, the Lord spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions. So here he is. Night has slowly passed, probably minute by minute, probably the longest night this king has ever spent. Finally, early in the morning, he can now go. The night has been spent. The law has been met. The requirements have been fulfilled. Now he goes, is Daniel, did your God deliver you? You wonder how long it took Daniel to reply. Probably right away. He said, oh, king, live forever. But maybe if Daniel was just a little bit mischief, he could have waited a little bit. But he did. we don't know if he did. But what, we, what he said, we know. He said, oh, king, live forever. He didn't say, oh, mean old king, why did you throw me in here? You son of the devil, why did you do this to me? 
He kept on honoring the king. He said, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. So Daniel knew who delivered him. Darius could not. Only God could. And the way God did it is he shut the mouths of the lions. I wonder if Daniel slept. I figure he probably did. He probably got a good night's sleep. A man of faith would. Because he knew God would deliver him. He had faith in God. But, but, but what, is this, uh, what was the foundation of that faith? First off, Daniel said, I was innocent. I hadn't done anything wrong. And I had not done anything wrong against you, O king. Because God's a just God. And Daniel would not see the deliverance being for any other reason except the fact that Daniel was just and God was a just God. So verse 23. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. So as as this story is being told, The writer here, Daniel, says the reason why he was spared, the reason why there was not a harm on his body whatsoever was because, quite simply, he believed in his God. So the story continues in verse 24. This was pretty convincing for Darius. The king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives, the, lives, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. And this was justice. Interestingly enough, it wasn't justice brought about by God. It was Darius. Because they had created a situation, they had created a trap to find a reason to charge Daniel with wrongdoing in a very unjust fashion. And so they themselves and their families ended up paying the price. But then notice Darius' decree in verse 25. King Darius says to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. His deliverers and rescue, he delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Now, an interesting thought, I think, in regards to Darius's decree He's not the only one that has tried to command the people to follow God. And we're talking about a people that normally would not be following God. Um, it, had been, it would be d- done later. And you stop and think about even in uh, Constantine within his reign um, later on in probably about, I think it's the third or fourth century. I'd have to go back and look at that. He issues a decree that basically makes Christianity kind of a, a national type law. But Darius missed something very important. He saw Jehovah God to be Daniel's God and saw that he should be feared. But it's still not the will of God for the nation to command the people to tremble before God because they weren't God's people. But he wanted them to have respect. And and the same thing, you think about the story of Jonah, the instance there where he goes and he preaches against the city of Nineveh and the whole city repents, especially the leader of the city repents before God. But I've often found it interesting here that with this case in point, that Darius still didn't get it. He he came real close and he understands God's greater than any of the other gods that they worshiped. And, and, And he delivers and he rescues. He works with signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. The other gods, the false gods didn't. I mean, maybe a, an earthquake would come or a storm would come. They would attribute a natural occurrence to the anger of the gods or the blessing of the gods. But hey, Daniel's God just kept these lions from chowing down on him. That's never been done. 
The lion's den may have been a normal form of punishment, of execution. And this is probably the first time they'd ever rolled the stone back and, hey, the guy's still alive. Not barely alive either. He's still living and kicking and that lion's never touched him. But what, what lessons can we kind of glean from this? There's probably two key lessons that can be seen within the text here. The first one is about prayer. When you stop and think about Daniel, he, yes, he knew that it was against the law now to pray. But it was his normal practice to go pray to God three times a day. Now, remember what we said earlier, they would pray looking out the window. They were effectively praying in the direction of their land, which was Canaan, um, or Judah, obviously. Then they would be praying in the direction of Jerusalem. They'd be praying in the direction of the temple because that's where they perceive the presence of God to be. But when we pray to God, in what direction do we pray? Do we go and we pray out the window? No, because there's no physical place for us to pray towards. Do we pray to some sort of physical manifestation of God, some sort of representation, not manifestation, representation? And the answer is no. When we pray, we pray to heaven. Not to heaven, but in the direction of heaven. We pray to God. And that's why no matter where we are, where, no matter where we are living, as Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we can lift up holy hands in prayer. Whether we're driving in our cars or whether, whether we are sitting at our homes or we assemble together in this manner, we can make petitions unto God. And this is what Daniel would have done. More than likely, when Daniel was praying to God, he may have been praying about the very thing, the very decree that Darius had signed. Maybe Daniel was praying even for deliverance at that point. The Bible teaches us that whenever we pray, we make prayers of supplications and intercessions. Again, back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We make these prayers and supplications and intercessions being made to God. But we pray to God. Who resides in heaven <clears throat> no longer is there a physical place as we said well ago it is spiritual and the prayers that we offer unto God is made possible because Jesus Christ died upon the cross of Calvary and became the mediator became in effect our intercessor Romans chapter 8 also identifies the Holy Spirit as our intercessor before God enabling us to pray but I wonder and this is a personal question would our lives not be better if we would establish within our lives the practice of praying three times a day? Not out of habit, not out of compulsion, not because it is some sort of sacrament, not because it's what the church expects us to do, but it's because we want to make petition to God because we need to pray to Him. We need to cast our cares upon him maybe we need to ask for the forgiveness of our sins maybe we need to pray for those who are sick that's the idea of again first timothy chapter 2 you have supplications and intercessions supplications when you make requests for yourself essentially prayers of intercessions where you pray on behalf of others and by the way he does tell us in the same passage there that we are to pray for the leaders of our land and it's very specific as to that prayer, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. The government in charge when Daniel prayed to God normally let Daniel pray. And if it wasn't for the handful of governors and satraps there to bring about this little plan against Daniel, there'd have been no problem. And so we pray. We pray daily unto God. The other lesson, though, is the truth that God delivers, that God will deliver us. Now, God does not deliver us from every problem of life. Our checkbooks would be a lot more healthier if he did. Think about the number of things that go wrong. You know, and there's sometimes in your life, your car decides to break down on you at the very same time that your air conditioner decides to go out. At home, air conditioner. You know, it's one thing and then the other. And so we pray to God, and sometimes we'll say, God, why are you letting all this bad stuff happen to me? 
You're supposed to deliver me. He delivered Daniel. He delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. Why don't you deliver me from this heartache of having to replace my air conditioner now? It's because by faith we trust in him to take care of us and deliver us from the things that truly threaten that which is most important. Daniel, what was most important in this case right here? Well, it's Daniel's life, obviously. But it also, there was a message to be sent to King Darius as well. Darius realized he couldn't deliver Daniel. His hands were tied. Have you ever found yourself in that moment where you're helpless? Someone is going through a problem, a trial, and, and, and they come to you, they want to talk to you about it, and, and, and they, 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 they somehow know the pill to you, and your hands are tied. There's not a thing you can do. Well, this was Darius's fault in part because he signed the decree. But his hands were tied. He felt helpless. And, but he had enough experience, and this goes back to letting our light so shine before men. He had enough experience with Daniel to recognize, all right, Daniel, your God will have to take care of you. And God did. God delivered him. We stop and think about the passages. We read throughout the New Testament. We find very clearly that when everything is said and done, there is a time when the Lord will always deliver us. And it's not always from the physical trials. It's not from the problems of life. It has everything to do with our spirit. Notice with me in Romans chapter 8, and I think this, this would be the New Testament equivalent of what Daniel has just gone through and the deliverance that he has found there. He says there in verse 35 of Romans chapter 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? By the way, it's the same chapter that tells us that we are children of God through the spirit of adoption. It is the same chapter that tells us the Lord hears our prayers and we see the spirit in verse 26 helps in our weaknesses. He talks about that there, same chapter. So verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. We saw that verse in our psalm study a couple weeks ago. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I want you to notice something there about the text. The text that we just read describes nothing shall be able to separate us from, okay? And what we're talking about is Daniel being delivered by God. The secret to always being delivered by God in the realm of what is ultimately most important, that is our spiritual soul. Here's the secret to it. You have to be walking with God, okay? You have to be walking in fellowship with God. The whole passage here, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Not even death can separate us from the love of Christ. We will always be delivered when we are always walking with the Lord. Daniel believed in God, God delivered him. If we will have faith in God, and we'll focus on what is most important within our lives, then we find that nothing will separate us from the love of God. We'll find that no matter what we go through, no matter how terrible and difficult life may be, we know that in the end, God is going to deliver us. It might not be from the heartaches of life. It might not even be from the threat of death. But we do know that our soul is safely within his hands. And as long as we walk in fellowship with him and trust in him, we know that he will deliver us. There's probably more lessons we could, we could glean from the lesson seen within Daniel and the lion's den. There are more things that we could talk about, but I would be sufficient or find it sufficient to say that if we will have the faith in God to trust in him, and to pray to him, take all of our, cast all our cares upon him, as Paul says. Then we can focus on what is most important, 
and that is serving the Lord, keeping his commandments, and living our lives faithful unto him. If we can do that, then we will be delivered from the greatest danger, from the greatest threat to our souls, will be delivered by the saving power of Christ, of God, and the mercy that he so richly bestowed upon us. You know, he tells the people in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, the folks of Smyrna, basically, don't worry what's going to happen. Some of you will be thrown in prison for 10 days. But he says, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of righteousness. And that's ultimately what our goal is. So ask yourself, are you, have you found yourself caught in some sort of lion's den? Do you find your life becoming such that there is danger and threat and worry all around you? Trust in God. Have faith in him. And ultimately, he will deliver you. You may have to endure some things in this physical body, but in the end, you'll spend eternity with him in heaven. If you're not a Christian, though, you need to get to that point. You need to have the faith that Daniel had. You need to have the conviction that says, I will follow God. I will turn away from my sins. I'll make that public confession and obey his command be baptized. Then you'll be made anew. You'll rise to walk in newness of life. You who were once dead in your trespasses and sins, you've been made alive through Jesus Christ. Paul writes to the brethren in Ephesus and Ephesians 2. That can be you tonight. And live faithful unto death to the end of your life and you'll spend eternity with God in heaven. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. It's time to repent. Put your trust back into God and be restored to his fellowship tonight. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.